Now we begin with reports of Russian airstrikes in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. At least seven people are said to be dead after attacks on military infrastructure. Meanwhile, a small band of Ukrainian soldiers are trying to hold on to the southern city of Mariupol. Russian attacks have already destroyed most of the city. But President Vladimir Zelensky has vowed Ukrainians will fight to the end. Charlie Daggett reports. Good morning, Lana. Ukraine's prime minister says Ukrainian forces continue to make a stand in Mariupol, and it has not fallen to Russian forces, despite renewed threats that any remaining fighters would be eliminated. There is not much left of Mariupol after weeks of an unrelenting Russian onslaught. But within this sprawling steel plant and the series of tunnels beneath it, a number of Ukrainian forces are still holding out, defying the ultimatum from Russia to surrender or die. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmytro Kuleba, told Face the Nation Russia is raising the city to the ground at any cost. The situation in Mariupol is both dire militarily and heartbreaking. Uh, the city doesn't exist anymore. In Kharkiv, medics treating an injured woman were forced to die for cover to save their own lives in the middle of an artillery attack. Amid the suffering and fear, worshippers gathered for the start of Holy Week in Ukraine. Easter is celebrated next Sunday. In Venezia, southwest of the capital, proto-deacon Vladislav prayed for the lives of the injured and the souls of the dead. But the war has turned the church into a battleground, too. After Russian Orthodox leaders gave their blessings to the war, and President Putin, too, Father Vladislav says that makes the Russian Orthodox Church an accomplice. It's a position no church should ever take, he said. Russia started this war not defending their territory, but attacking the territory of our country. Even as the war rages on, he's praying for peaceful Easter. Is it more difficult to hope under the circumstances? When people undergo all this grief and atrocities and they still hope, still believe, still say they feel the hand of God that guides them, this belief becomes their reality. New images have emerged showing that Russian warship that went down in the Black Sea last week, showing smoke billowing and the ship starting to sink after allegedly being struck by Ukrainian missiles. Naval experts have identified that it is the ship. They can't confirm where or when those images were taken. Lana and Vlad. All right, Charlie, thank you. With us now from Lviv is an award-winning photojournalist, Finbar O'Reilly. He's an independent photographer and regular contributor to the New York Times. Finbar, welcome. So what can you tell us about these reported missile strikes in Lviv? So Lviv just woke up to the sound of explosions and um, skyline. And... Um, I went to the, the scene, the explosions, uh, where you know, you're just seeing on your screen there now the, the smoke that was rising up over the city. And um, officials here are quite uh, touchy about that there was a police cordon around the area. Uh, some images have come out of firefighters now. I was able to get some pictures uh, of the one location of the four that was hit. Uh, that was a civilian location, it appears to have been uh, what officials have called a tire fitting plant. So that's where I was photographing. The other three hit me and so it was a little bit on edge this morning. This was really mm -hmm. the first time, you know, even that there were seven up to seven people killed um, in this attack. And these are the first known deaths from the war in, in Lviv, which is quite far west in the country. And so far been spared the kind of devastation that we've seen from from other parts in, mm -hmm. in the east and, and closer to the capital in the center of, of the country. Uh, Finbar, I'll just point out for our audience, obviously you're in Lviv and uh, the sometimes signal isn't as stable as we want it to be. So if people uh, hear you cutting off them, just explain that. But, but let's talk about the people who have sought refuge in and around where you are right now in Lviv. Uh, where can they now go? Right. So, so what you're seeing around the whole city is is a population that has has 
uh, to, to try and engage with this effort, a sort of existential effort to, um, to fight off a, a, an external threat. And so uh, people have opened their homes, there are gymnasiums, there are sports complexes, there are uh, all kinds of places where people are taking shelter who have come from other parts of the city at the train station even. Um, there are places where people can stay briefly as they transit uh, through to Poland or other countries further afield. So there are a number of sites around the city where people are sheltered and, um, and are, are being looked after by community organizations, church groups, the, and various community organizations um, to food, bedding, clothing, and uh, some of the basic comforts that people coming from other parts of the country require when, once they get here. Finbar, you have worked before in conflict zones. Uh, I'm wondering both how the situation compares to what you've seen before, and also, are you hoping that the images uh, that you're sending out to the rest of the world compel any particular type of action? Well, I think, um, to answer your first question, uh, every conflict has a character, uh, and and this one is is unusual in the sense that it's taking place in Europe, which we haven't seen for for decades. Most of the conflicts that I've covered have been um, uh, in Africa and the Middle East, and I think uh, this, you know this conflict is is particularly devastating here in Ukraine, obviously, um, but of course it has wider repercussions in the sense that. Um, it has caused problems with a lot of the grain that is used uh, to be shipped to other parts of the world um, to combat hunger globally is produced in Russia and Ukraine and funds that have been diverted from other conflicts as well are, are being sent here. So, so there's, there's a kind of knock on ripple effect um, that is not only affecting severely but in other parts of the world as well. And that's it's always something to keep in mind as well when we're looking at what's happening in the um, uh, your to, to, to sort of convey is that I'm coming in as this war has now been going on for over two months and we've been bombarded, sorry to use that word, uh, with a, a constant stream of images of, um, of frontline conflict, uh, artillery strikes. And so I'm, I'm a little further from the front line here for the most part, with the exception of, of these strikes today. Um, but really, I'm trying to show the rhythm of life and the pace of life um, in the rear guard, really, a, a little bit further away from where the fighting is happening and where much of the population that has fled those uh, areas is, is, is trying to rage in the short term until they feel that it's safe for them to go home. So really just showing the rhythm and pattern of people who are affected by this war and, and uh, their compatriots who are trying to help them and look after them in the ways they can. And then there are a lot of funerals as well. Over mm. the last two days, I've been photographing funerals of soldiers. Um, and that is kind of just showing some of the toll in a way that is a little bit different from some of the images that we've been seeing coming from the front lines. All right. Finbar O'Reilly, thank you for joining us and stay safe. Thank you.